Uh, I want to share a little bit before we dive in just about the beginning of my ministry uh, when I started working in a church full time. And so it doesn't matter if you have ever worked in a church or ever even thought about working in a church. If you've ever had a job, be prepared to feel really good about yourself right now, okay? Because within the first four months of my first uh, ministry position, I was a youth pastor. Um, I led a mission trip that I had not planned. Uh, Somebody else planned it, and I came in like two months before we took this trip. And a a couple of, of crazy things happened. A kid cut his finger off, okay? Didn't get fired for that, so, you know, maybe we were all desperate for something. Uh, uh, So Michigan has, we lived in Michigan. Michigan has an upper peninsula. We were on our way back from north central Minnesota. Uh, We made a pit stop, had some lunch, and I left a couple kids in the UP. (laughs) Turns out you're supposed to count them every time. Not just once. I'm like, well, I know, give or take. And I always made jokes like, hey, we have a margin of error of like plus or minus three kids as long as we come back. That is not actually how things work. You have to bring back the same amount of kids. You can't bring back the same amount and different kids. You have to, like the parents, for some reason, want their kids back. And so, um, like I know Washington has a peninsula, but Michigan's peninsula is not connected by land. Okay, we, I left them in the Upper Peninsula. That meant there was water between us. And so I had to go back across the bridge and go get them. And uh, they're, uh, I didn't get fired. So, you know, there's those things. Uh, those were some crazy things to deal with, and, and I never thought I'd have to deal with those kind of things. There were other things that I just, like, wasn't prepared for in ministry, and that was uh, kids coming up to me and sharing all the things that they were going through. Like, they would share about, um, I remember one, uh, one student came up and, and just talked about, they, they, and actually this was a, a couple of, of different times, um, couldn't stop cutting themselves. It just like this deep need to, to cut and hurt themselves. Uh, there were students that confessed addictions. Uh, there, there were kids that shared and confided in me about parents being emotionally, verbally, and even physically abusive. And I'm thinking, I don't know what I've gotten myself into. Like, and as they are all coming up and sharing these things, they're coming to me because they think, like, I can do something about it. They think that I can help them. And on the outside, like, I'm trying to play it really, really cool. I'm like, okay, yeah, like, let's pray. Let's do all this other stuff. But on the inside, I'm thinking, I don't know. This is impossible. Like, I can't, what, whatever they're asking, I can't fix that. It's impossible. That's how I felt. Now, I don't know what kind of impossible situations you've been in. You know, sometimes we use that word impossible, like, uh, well, that thing's impossible. Like, it just, it's, it's like we speak in hyperbole. Like, if you were to say, Dan, you're going to run a marathon, I'm like, impossible. Never going to run a marathon. This is not like I get winded walking up the stairs. I'm not going to run a marathon. It's impossible. Well, could I actually do it? Yes, but I'm never going to do it. Right? So like, that's a bit high, uh, of hyperbole. But there's, there's been some other like, truly impossible situations in life that we come up against, and we have to understand some things. Right? So I don't know if you've ever had these impossible situations, and these are the kind of ones I'm talking about. Uh, my father-in-law has had a, a long uh, career in physical labor, and he's been run over by a lot of things. He's fallen out of a lot of things, and it hasn't treated his body so well, believe it or not, you know? Uh, and, and his back has, has actually suffered quite a bit. And so he went to the doctor, and the doctor said, well, you know, we could, we could do some fusing, but I'd need to fuse here, and I'd need to fuse here, and, like, just honestly, I'm not sure where to stop. Like, we'd have to fuse everything. Like, it's that bad. There was so much degeneration and damage in his back. Like, we would just, we'd have to fuse it all. And so your quality of life isn't going... In fact, your quality of life, your mobility is going to get worse. You're actually not going to be more comfortable. This is not really a, a good solution. It was kind of an impossible solution because the only result was, well, the best we could do is pain management. Right? That's the, that's the best we could do. There's, there's no fix for this. There's only pain management. We can manage your pain. Like, that's an impossible situation. No, nobody can fix that. Now, now, here's what I believe. It, it doesn't matter whether it's a, a situation like that or some other impossible situation. Maybe, there, maybe there's broken relationship. Maybe there's uh, an experience you've had in your past. Maybe there's trauma there. Maybe there's hurt. There's wounds. That, that, like, it, it just feels impossible. 
I believe this. I believe that all of us, even though we, we recognize and we can note the impossible, that we also know that something can touch the impossible. We just, we might not have it yet. And the good news, I believe, is that there is a way into and through the impossible. I want to uh, ask you to turn with me to Acts chapter 3. Last week, Pastor Jaskarin took us into uh, Acts chapter 2, and we saw all sorts of incredible things. We saw the, the followers of Jesus go from uh, hiding and praying and, and in fear of the religious leaders to all of a sudden the Spirit of God gets poured out and they start speaking in ridiculous languages and over 3,000 people uh, come and are added to their number. There are over 3,000 people are added to followers of Jesus in that one moment. And it's just incredible. Like, it's a night and day difference. And then the rest of the story, the rest of the account of the church in the book of Acts has to do with how crazy and how interesting and how different things go from being this group of people who are hiding in fear and hiding in fear of religious leaders and persecution to this incredibly bold group of people who are doing all sorts of things and don't even care when they're beat and imprisoned. Like, that's a radical transformation in the midst of so many things that seem impossible. And so we're going to read this impossible story here, and, and we're going to just find out what God has for us today. Starting in verse 1. One day Peter and John were going up to the temple at the time of prayer at 3 in the afternoon. Now a man who was lame from birth was being carried to the temple gate called Beautiful, where he was put every day to beg from those going into the temple courts. When he saw Peter and John about to enter, he asked them for money. Peter looked straight at him, as did John. Then Peter said, look at us. So the man gave them his attention, expecting to get something from them. Then Peter said, silver or gold I do not have, but... What I do have, I give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk. Taking him by the right hand, he helped him up, and instantly the man's feet and ankles became strong. He jumped to his feet and began to walk. Then he went with them into the temple courts, walking and jumping and praising God. And when all the people saw him walking and praising God, they recognized him as the same man who used to sit begging at the temple gate called Beautiful, and they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. Now, this is, a, this is an impossible story. Uh, when we come on the scene, we have Peter and John, and they're going into the temple at the time of prayer about three in the afternoon. Now, Jewish people, they, they prayed three times a day. They prayed three times a day. It was their prayer pattern, and as often as they could, they would do that in the synagogues or in the temples. And so we see Peter and John just continuing that. Like, prayer had always been a part of it, but now they weren't hiding in a room anymore, anymore uh, huddled together praying. They were bold, and they were out, and they were participating in prayer. And so when they go to the temple at three in the afternoon, they're still in Jerusalem. Uh, that's where they have been. That's where they stay. And we read in verses 2 and 3, we read this. Now a man was, who was lame from birth was being carried to the temple gate called Beautiful. We got a guy. He's never walked a day in his life. It, there, there's not something broken in him in the sense that it was working and now it's not. It never worked. His, his legs never worked. He never learned how to walk. He didn't have the neurological connections. He didn't have any of that. But every day he was carried by his friends to this beautiful gate. And for the uh, scholarly nerds among us who like to go back and investigate which gate it is, you, you're not going to know. It's just, it's not the official name. It's like the local name. It was the most beautiful gate. And so they walked through that beautiful gate. And they liked going to that beautiful gate. And so this gentleman, he's never walked a day in his life. He doesn't have the ability to, he doesn't even have the knowledge of how to, is carried by his friends so that he can beg. Now, uh, the reason he's carried and, and placed there is because he's not able to work, he's not able to provide for himself. And being at this beautiful gate, is, it's a really popular place to go into the temple. It's the one you want to go into. And so it would be a really good gate to beg at. People are generous. Not only were uh, the Jewish people incredibly diligent about their prayer times, one of their uh, staple methods of worship was giving. It was generosity. It was giving alms. It was giving money. And so they would have money on them, and they'd be going into the temple ready to give. And, and so this, this, this gentleman was being placed at this temple thinking, maybe I could get just a little bit of the cut. You know, maybe, maybe I could get just enough for today. Maybe, maybe they'll hand me something on their way in. It seemed like a good strategy, right? So he's carried there every single day, and he begs from those going into the temple courts. Now, when Peter, in verse 3 we read, when Peter and John are about to enter, 
Uh, he asked them for money, pretty standard, okay? Uh, pretty standard, but something different has just occurred. What I love is this is the first miraculous story that we hear following the filling of the church with the Spirit of God. Now, is this the actual first story? We don't know this, if chronologically this is how it all happened. But what we do know is that the author of the book of Acts is Luke. This is how he wants us to see it. This is how he wants to tell the story. This is how he wants us to see the progression of how drastically different things were without the Spirit of God, without an empowered life, and with an empowered life. And so he, he shares about this guy who's he's been carried to the beautiful gate every single day and he's been begging. And my guess, he's been carried there for a long time and at this point, this gentleman is just, he's just part of the backdrop. His, his requests for money, they're just part of the noise. It's, it's just white noise at this point. Think about it. He's been there likely through all three prayer times each day and the people who go in through this gate have probably seen him so many times, they'd be surprised if he wasn't there. He's just become part of the scenery. He just blends into the background, and at this point, he's probably even unseen. In fact, I think the picture that we get of this gentleman is he's just holding out his hands, or he's holding up a bowl or a dish of some sort just to collect, just something that he can hold coins in, and he probably just keeps his head down, and he's probably just begging. He's probably just money, you know, give, please help if you can. And he's just keeping his eyes down so much so that when we read that Peter and James come along in verse 4, they look straight at him, and Peter says, look at us. He's gotten so used to sitting there that he doesn't even lift up his eyes. He's not even expectant of anything anymore because he knows he's just part of the scenery. This is what he does every day. Either they're going to give or they're not. But now Peter and John come along, and something is drastically different. And they look at this gentleman, and they say, no, look at us. And so he raises his eyes. Now, here's what I think is going on in the background. You see, these are disciples that have spent three years with Jesus, and they've learned how to do things the way Jesus did them. They've already seen miracles. They've participated under the authority of Jesus' ministry and and helped and and even um, done some of the miracles. They've seen some incredible things happening at their own hands and at the hands of Jesus but now something is different. They, they don't, they're not just being sent out in training from Jesus. They are empowered to do everything that Jesus did. And part of their learning of doing things how Jesus did is, is they heard Jesus say this a, a whole lot. I only do what I see the Father doing. And so here's what I think is going on in the background. These spirit-filled uh, believers, J, uh, John and, and Peter, are looking at this person and they hear the Lord speaking to them about something that's about to happen. I think they see something different. They, they notice him, and they realize God is moving in this moment. He's about to do something. Now, again, uh, people have been walking by this guy. Uh, presumably, Peter and John have walked by this guy many times. But today, there's something different. Today, God is working in that person's life in a way that he has not yet. Today, something is qualitatively different about Peter and John. And so they command him, look at us. And the man does. He gives him his attention because he's thinking, wait, is somebody actually going to give me some money? Is that, is that what's going to happen? And my, the next line is my absolute favorite in verse 6. Then Peter says, silver or gold I do not have, but what I do have I give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk. Now, uh, Peter and John, uh, they're, they're going to pray. Uh, they're probably going to give some money as an offering. So, like, the question arises in my mind, like, do they really have money? Or are they kind of, like, lying to the guy? I don't know. What, what we do know is in the early church, like, so many people were coming along, and they were selling their property, and they were laying everything down at the feet of the apostles. And they were trusting the apostles to give where giving was needed. So, so my guess is, actually, if, if Peter and... And John were at all having access to the common purse, the common fund that that the church was using. They they might have actually had some money. But I think something else is also going on, that, that as Peter and John see this man, they realize God is at work. They see something different about this moment than they have every single time they pass by. And and I think what Peter realizes is that I could give him money right now. I could give him money right now, but that's not what he needs. 
Now, uh, I've heard so many people say, uh, especially people that grew up in church and have walked away from the church, they're like, hey, don't pray for me. I don't need your thoughts. I don't need your prayers. I need somebody that can actually help me. Now, that makes me really, really sad because what that means is the prayers that the church has been praying don't do anything. I think if, if Peter and John prayed some of the same prayers that we pray, this man would have been better off receiving silver or gold. But that's not what Peter thinks. He knows something's different. And so he says, look at me. And I think they share a moment. I think they're kind of reading each other for just a minute. And then Peter says, I don't, I don't have silver or gold, but I have something better. What I do have, I give to you. Jesus had been walking with his disciples so many times, and he sends them out, and he says, freely you've received, now freely give. What did they, what did they receive? They didn't receive anything material. They didn't see, receive any wealth. They didn't receive any honor or glory. All they received was the authority of Jesus and the sending of Jesus to go out in his name and do everything he commanded them. And now Peter is recalling that in his mind, and he says, I remember that Jesus sent us, and he told us to go heal the sick, raise the dead, cast out demons, and proclaim the good news that the kingdom of God is here. And so he says, look at me. You don't need silver or gold, but you do need what I have. You need to walk. And so he speaks to him. He says, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk. And then in verse 7, he takes him by the right hand and he helps him up. And instantly we read, this man gets to his feet and his ankles became strong. Now, I want to slow down here for just a moment because what is happening here is not just a healing. Right? A healing is when you are injured or something stops functioning the way that it used to be functioning. You're, you're restoring it back to what it was. But this man never walked a day in his life. Now, uh, it, it, like the, the body is a weird thing. If you don't use the muscles, they stop being able to, to be used. Right? The, the atrophy in your muscles begins four days after you stop using them. That means four days without any kind of exercise or activity, those muscles say, I guess you don't need me anymore. And they start to deteriorate as soon as four days after. And after two to three weeks, you can actually start telling a difference in your own physical appearance. And then it gets even worse than that. Now, this, this gentleman, presumably an adult, has never walked a day in his life. That means that his lower half is likely like a skeleton. He doesn't have the muscle mass. He doesn't have the strength in his tendons. He doesn't have any of those things that hold his structure together so that he can actually walk. And on top of that, we've, we've already said he's never walked a day in his life. It means he doesn't, have the, he doesn't have the neurological connections in his mind to know how to put one foot in front of the other. He doesn't know how his legs work. He's never done it. This is not just a healing. This is a creative miracle. God created something through Peter and John's word, their simple command of walk, created something in this man that did not exist before. That's why, he, it doesn't just say he was healed, but it says instantly the man's feet and ankles became strong. There was strength where there was none. There was an understanding of how to use his legs and coordinate his body that was not there before. This was a creative work of Jesus in the life of somebody who desperately needed it. And he thought he was just going to get some money. He thought all he needed was a few coins for the day. I mean, how many times do we look at something that's just instantly gratifying or, or we see the fix to our need in something lesser when God has something greater for us? What if we're settling for silver or gold when, when Jesus wants to command us to walk? And what kind of faith is required for me and you if that's what we're called to do? That's impossible. That's impossible. You, we're supposed to do that? Yeah, we're supposed to do that. But that's impossible. Yeah, it is. It is. That's why Peter says, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk. And instantly the strength in the feet and the ankles happens and he jumps to his feet in verse 8 and he begins to walk and then he went with them into the temple courts and he was walking and he's jumping and he's praising God. Could you imagine that? Like somebody who's never walked in a day, and I'd be thinking like, how do you know how to jump? 
And he's jumping around and he's praising God and he's causing such a distraction. And now everybody that walked by this guy at the gate called Beautiful, when all the people saw him walking and praising God in verse 9, they recognized him as the same man who used to sit begging at the temple gate called Beautiful. They recognized, like that was part of the scenery. He was there all the time. I remember he was always asking for money. How is he in here? Now, I think part of the natural part of myself would have been like, he's faking. He was a fake every day. He was just sitting there. He didn't need the money. No, he was strengthened. There was a creative miracle going on. They knew that he used to sit there and he was a beggar and he couldn't even move his legs. And now he's running and he's jumping and he's rejoicing and his head is lifted up. He has his dignity and his pride back. You see, that's what the, that's what the miracles of God do in somebody. That's what the power of God through an empowered life of a believer of Jesus is meant to do. Guys, we read about these things and we're like, oh, that's so cool. That, that's such an impossible, I can't, I would have loved to be there at the time. It's supposed to happen now. It's not just for then. The miracles of Jesus, the work of the Holy Spirit wasn't, listen, all of history did not build up so that Jesus could send the Spirit so that he could write the Bible so that we don't need his presence anymore. That's not how it works. That's settling for the lesser. Because as beautiful as the word of God is, it pales in comparison with who he is when his presence is manifest with us. It's not just for them. It's not just the one-time thing. It's not something that we read about and think, oh man, I wish that was happening today. It can happen today. In fact, it's supposed to happen today. It's supposed to be happening regularly today. Like this is the common experience of the empowered life of the believer. Everything is drastically, if you've been filled with the Spirit of God, this is your new normal. If you've been spirit filled with the Spirit of God, if you have the empowered life, it doesn't just begin with tongues or it doesn't just uh, start with some other manifestation of the Spirit. It doesn't just start with some kind of experience of God. When, when I first had uh, my baptism in the Spirit, I didn't even know it, okay? And I don't mean I didn't know it because I didn't understand or I didn't feel anything or sense anything. I didn't know that was supposed to happen. I wasn't even asking for it. I was just worshiping the Lord and one day I was worshiping the Lord with other people, and the presence of God just came on me like I had never experienced, and I just stopped singing. The only thing I could say is, oh, wow. That's all I could, I just repeated that, oh, wow. Oh, wow, and I was glad everybody else, and the music was still going on, because I'm like, they probably all think I'm an idiot right now, and they probably, I mean, they probably thought that anyway, but that's different than what was, ex you know, that was just my personality. I was just, oh, wow. And then I remember I went back, and, and my home church, I was attending somebody else's youth group, and my my home church youth group was still going on and there was just a handful of people that I went to school with and I showed back up and I, like, I, I boldly engaged with them in a way that I had never had it before and I started praying over them and that was not me. Like I was like the black sheep pastor's kid sort of a guy. And I even remember one person saying to me, who are you? And what have you done with Dan? I'm like, I don't know anymore. I don't know anymore. Like, this is what you get. Like, be, just whatever. Like, let's just pray. And let's see what God, and it was amazing. But I didn't have words for it. I didn't have words for my experience. I didn't know what was going on. I just knew that things were drastically different and that this needed to be my new norm. Like, this is the new normal. Is that the church of the spirit filled people of God are meant to go out every single day in the power of God and, and we're supposed to encounter the miraculous things all the time. And it's not just for the super special people, it's not just for the, the super spiritual people, it's for anybody that wants into the family of God and asks for the spirit of God, this is for you. In fact, here's what I want you to catch. Everyone, like if you're, if you're a writing person, I want you to write this down, okay? Everyone can do the impossible in the power of the Spirit. Now, if you wrote that down, underline everyone and impossible. Everyone can do the impossible in the power of the Spirit. Peter and John look at the gentleman at the gate called Beautiful, and they say, look at me. Fix your eyes on me. Like, pay attention, because what you thought you are getting is not what you get. You're going to get something better. 
And then he speaks and he says, in the name of Jesus, stand up and walk. Peter just did what, like, he, he's done so many other times, but, but there's something different, and it's the power of God because of the Spirit of God in him. And, and you can look back at this. You can look all of Scripture. Like, I, I encourage you, go back and read every miraculous thing that ever happened, any reference to the Spirit of God on the people of God, and you're going to find something out. Every time the Spirit of God comes on his people, it is to participate and continue the ministry and work of Jesus. It is to do something. Guess what? That means that if you receive the Spirit, the Spirit's not in you to make you nice. He'll, he'll do that. Like if you have a hard time loving people, He's going to help you be more loving. That's true. That's going to happen. But that's not why the Spirit came on you. The Spirit comes on you because He needs you to do something in conjunction with the mission of God. And it's going to mess up the rest of your life. In the best possible way, it's going to mess up what you just think is normal. And you're going to have to fight against what is like just expected when you walk out your front door in the morning. You're just going to have to start expecting that things are going to be radically different. Because everyone, everyone, every one of us can do the impossible in the power of the Holy Spirit. Not just can, will be, should be, need to be. But that's impossible. Yes, it is. It's impossible for me. It's impossible for you. But by the power and the Spirit of God, we can say to people, look at me. What you're after is not what you need. What you need is you need a touch from God. It's going to radically transform your life. How was this man's life different after this? I've heard, I've heard people talk about things like this, and they're like, well, we can't just pray for him to be healed because then he doesn't know how to walk. I'm like, really? You're going to trust God to, to heal him but not to teach him how to walk? Like, where's God? That's the line? Like, that's where God's limitations are? He's like, well, you can heal him, but he can't do this next thing. Like God wants to take care of it all. When God moves, he wants to move thoroughly and completely. And it's, it's sometimes our ifs or buts that get in the way. But, but God, like if, we, if I pray for that, what happens if you don't show up? What happens if I'm left out there like an idiot? Well, I have a pretty good strategy for that. Just be an idiot all the time. And then nobody's surprised. That's like, that's my go-to. That's how I do things in life. You're like, well, Dan's an idiot, but he's always an idiot. He's consistently an idiot. Like, that's, I'm consistent. I'm not remarkable, but I'm consistent. Give it a go. Like, here's, here's what I'm asking for us this week. I'm asking that each of us step into the impossible. Each of us participate in the impossible work of God because we're going to step into impossible situations, but we have to understand that we have an impossibly powerful God. He's a God that meets us in the impossible and he radically transforms it. Like if death itself can't hold down the power of God, then there's not a single impossible thing you encounter in your daily life that the power of God can't meet you in. Not a single thing. If resurrection is possible, then it's possible in the life and through the life of every single believer. And not just so that you can receive it. And I believe God wants you to receive it. But the power, the empowered life is on you so that you can give what you've received. So that we can look at situations and say, you know, I know that seems like it's the solution, but there's something better. I, I know it seems like silver and gold would be good, but I have something better. We don't have to just say sending thoughts and prayers and encourage people because we know there's power in prayer. And if there's not power in our prayer, we have to go back and we have to ask the Lord, why not? Remember, that was one of the most remarkable things. I was talking with a mentor and I said, listen, I don't know why the power of God's not showing up when I pray. He was like, well, did you ever ask him? And I was like, well, no. But I didn't want you to point that out to me because now I feel dumb. Again, it's a common feeling. I'm pretty used to it. But when there's not power through our prayer, we do have to ask why. But the challenge to all of us is to go and move in power, to go into the, the impossible, to, to see the miracles happen. 
And each of us can do that if we pay. Like, I want to remind us of just a few things. Some of you know these things. This might be new for some of you. But the first one is I want you to understand something. Understand that you have been authorized. Understand that you have been authorized. Just as uh, Peter and John go out and they're, they're, they talk to the gentleman at the, at the gate and they say, in the name of Jesus, that's, that's the authority of Jesus. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, get up and walk. What they understand about Jesus is that he is over all. He's not just over the lame man at the gate. He's over broken marriages. He's over broken, uh, he's over broken mental states. He's over addiction. He's over broken limbs. He's over missing limbs. He's over everything. And that person who's over everything has authorized his followers to go and operate the same way that he did. He didn't just authorize you to baptize somebody in some water. I don't think he needed to send the Spirit for that one. I've been chucking people into water for a long time without the power of the Spirit. We need the power of the Spirit to step into the impossible. We need the authority of Jesus to do the impossible. And he sent us out, he is sending us out, and he will continue to send us out in the authority. The authority that is over everything. There is no other name, and it doesn't matter what sickness, illness, demonic presence, no matter what you name, it is under the authority of Jesus. And it has to come under. Not because you are so big and so bad. I'm not so big and so bad. We don't get to go around being like, I got authority. I've seen people do that. I've got authority. I'm like, if you had authority, you probably wouldn't have to shout it so loud. <laughs> no, the one with authority is the one who can be in the midst of an impossible situation and have full confidence that it's under Jesus' power. That's what authority looks like. So remember, you've been authorized. You've been given the right to act under Jesus' mission. You've been given the right. That's what authority is. You've been given the right to operate the way Jesus did. You've been given the right to wield his power to restore. And the second thing you need to do is you need to ask for the power, right? So we have the authority of Jesus, and then we have to ask for the power. Now, some of you have asked, maybe last week was your first week asking for the power and presence of God on your life, but it's not a one-time thing. It's a continued thing. Last week, Pastor Jaskarin said it happened in Acts 2, and then he referred to Acts chapter 4, and, and each time the manifestations of the Spirit just kept happening, and it's the same group of people because they just kept asking. They knew there was always more of God to be experienced, and that no matter what they were heading into, they needed to make sure they were asking for the presence of God. They needed to make sure they were asking for the power of God. They needed to make sure that they go into the midst of the impossible with power. So we need to keep asking for it. Even now, I, just, I want to invite you, just close your eyes for a second. If you're comfortable doing that, and if you're not comfortable doing that, maybe you take a little nap. I don't know. It's fine. But close your eyes for a second. I just want to, like, this is the most basic prayer we can ask for power, and it's come Holy Spirit. Come, Holy Spirit. Come, empower, Holy Spirit. Can you just join me in that? Even just lifting up your voice. Pray out loud. Come, Holy Spirit. If that's the only prayer you have, just come, Holy Spirit. Come, Holy Spirit. Come, Holy Spirit. Come, empower. Come, Lord Jesus. Come, name of Jesus. Come, mighty wind. Friends, this is the prayer that we pray. You can open your eyes. This is the prayer that we pray. You could, you could just repeat this endlessly. Come, Holy Spirit. Come, Holy Spirit. It's his power that we need because it is impossible. Those situations, they are impossible. I do not have the ability to strengthen somebody who's been lame from birth. I don't have the ability to open the eyes of the blind, but the power of Jesus does, and he told me to go do it. So I ask for his power. And I'm not going to stop asking. And the last thing I want to encourage you to do Sometimes we go out and we're like, well, it didn't work. I've done it before. I've prayed for healing before, but why? This thing still happened. It didn't work. I did what you told me to do, but it didn't work. We can't be afraid of failing. Don't be afraid to fail. Be willing, in fact, to fail. Go out and see how many times failure is going to take until you get it right. Now, one of the guys that I love who has talked about this, and he's passed on, but his name was John Wimber, and he was, uh, uh, just moved in incredible power of God and, and movement of the Spirit. But John Wimber was teaching at a conference, and he was sharing a story. 
He was talking about the story of his church that he started. And for, for the, the, the beginning of the church, they, they, like, they felt that God wanted them to move in the healing power of Jesus. They wanted, he knew that God was asking them to pray for healing and to see healing. He was like, okay, we're going to do this. I read that it happens in your Bible. I, like, the things you wrote, the things you said, God, you, you told us to go do that, so we're going to go do that. But nothing happened. And they were praying for these things almost daily. They were asking for these things. Not just like once, not just twice. Like they didn't show up on one Sunday and be like, well, nobody got healed, so I don't know what to do with that. They just kept doing it for nine months. They kept praying almost daily for healings over the sick and over people who just needed to be restored. And nothing was happening. Not a single one happened for nine months. And he was getting pretty discouraged. He was trying, like, he was at the end of himself. He's like, I don't even know if this is going to happen anymore. I don't know if this is what God, like, are we just going to pray forever and nothing's going to happen? And then he tells a story about the first one that happened. And I have a video clip I'll, I'll, we're going to play. If you just click on that clip, um, this is John Wimber sharing what happened. I sure hope it works. If not, you're going to get my acting skills. Got to get in character. Got to get in my job. It might not work. Okay. So, uh, okay, here we go. <laughs> so John Wimber stands up before this conference, and he's sharing about, he gets a call, and this is a couple that's only visited their church once. And, uh, and they call him as the pastor, and they're like, hey, I got a job interview tomorrow, and my wife is sick. She is sick, and I need you to come, like, I need you to come heal her. Will you come pray over her and heal her? And so he's like, Inside, he's thinking, no, and, but outside, he's like, I'll be right there. And so he hangs up, he drives to their house, and he gets in there, and he, he, he recounts the moment where he saw his wife. He's like, I'm, I'm thinking that she probably has like a cold. And he walks in, he's like, I think maybe I could handle a cold. I think maybe I could pray for a cold or some sinus infection. Maybe it could clear up. And he goes, I saw in there, and she was sick. Like, I mean sick, sick. Like, she was so sick, she didn't have to tell me she was sick. I could see her sick. She was that sick. And I thought, oh, no, Lord, come on, could you, like, I just, I needed an easy one. And so he goes up, and he's like, well, um, all right. So he goes over to the wife, and the husband's behind him, and he's like, he said he mumbled a prayer. In fact, uh, he, the way he described his prayer was short and faithless. That's the kind of prayer he prayed. He, was, he said something like, uh, okay, so be healed in Jesus' name. And then he turned around and immediately started describing, uh, explaining to the husband why God doesn't always heal. Like, he turned around, he was like, oh, so, um, I just, like, it doesn't always happen, and, you know, we don't have to be discouraged by that. We just... And then the guy's, like, looking right past him, and he's like, wait, what are you looking at? He's like, well, my wife, she's up and around, she's, she's fine. And he turns around, he goes, how did that happen? <laughs> how did these, and she's like, you healed me. He's like, I didn't need to, that wasn't me. And she was like, okay, well, um, we're going to have some coffee. Do you want some, I'm going to make some coffee. Do you want some coffee? He's like, no, I just... I'm going to go. I'm going to go. And so he like wanders out and he gets outside and he starts jumping and fist pumping. He's like, we got one. We got one. And then he said this. We, we got a quote from John Wimber. He says, I'd rather lay hands on 100 people and have only one healed than to lay hands on nobody and have nobody healed. Here's the truth. If you never step into the power of the spirit and you never ask for the impossible, you guaranteed will get what you don't ask for. You will never see somebody healed if you don't pray for healing. And if you have to pray for 100 people and only see one, maybe start praying for another 100. And we're not just talking about healing. We're talking about all sorts of, of the miraculous things. Be willing to fail. It's okay. You don't have to defend God. He said, go do it. He said, go do it. Here's my spirit. Here's my power. Go do it. We don't have to worry about the, the outcomes of that. And if God can use a short, faithless, mumbled prayer to bring about healing because we were obedient to what he was doing, then we're in pretty good territory. That's what we're called to. That's what we need to do. I'm asking you to, to, to be bold. Now, that doesn't mean just going around and being like slapping people on the knee and be like, you're healed, go! We've got to be like Peter and John. We've got to be looking for where God's working ahead of us. Is we want to be in lockstep with the Spirit. We want to be doing what He's doing. We want, we want to be moving where He's moving. If He's moving and healing in somebody, then, then we do that. 
And if we do that, it doesn't matter how short or faithless our prayer is, God's going to back it up. Because healing, authority, power, it's all in obedience to what God has asked us to do. I want to invite the, the worship team up, and, and we're just going to, we're going to pray for a second. And we're just going to, we're going to wait on the Lord. Holy Spirit, come. Holy Spirit, move. We need you. God, we want to step into the impossible. We want to see what you're doing, and we want our lives to be filled by your presence and power to join in on the restorative work that you do all around the world. Forgive us for being so easily discouraged or for making excuses or for presumptively explaining why you don't do that anymore. God, we even confess today as a church that oftentimes in our faithless prayers, in our lack of prayers, that you've given us just what we expected. Now, Lord, would you turn our hearts and minds to expect something different? We ask you to speak, Holy Spirit. What do you want to do? pray with me. In whatever words, in whatever prayer language you want to pray, would you just ask the Holy Spirit to speak? Ask Him to move. Ask Him to show us what He wants us to do. I'll be honest, just a, a brief confession. I was nervous stepping up today because I, I had a picture when we were worshiping and I was praying. And I was, I was a little bit nervous to say this thing out loud, but I was hearing the Spirit say, you've got to say it. Like, are you going to say it or not? And I saw a picture um, of a woman's hair and she was pulling it out and I knew that the root cause was rape. And I, I think it was anxiety. I think there's a source of anxiety from rape or mol molestation. And so I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand. I'm not going to ask you to do anything like that. I'm just going to ask you to close your eyes. And if that's you, I just want you to whisper in the silence of your own heart this morning. That's me. I'm going to pray over you because this morning I believe Jesus wants to, I believe he wants to do a miracle in you. I believe he wants to heal you of what happened when you were vulnerable and helpless. And he's gonna, he's gonna break off the symptoms of that anxiety. Jesus, we, we release healing over wounds of, of sexual abuse. We release healing in the name of Jesus, release from anxiety related to rape and molestation. Lord, would you undo the damage that was done? And I see the Lord removing shame right now. Shame, go in Jesus' name. We've only seen this once, once before as Janine and I have been doing ministry, but there was, there was a girl who just pulled her hair out because of anxiety. And I just have the sense that somebody is doing that in response to the anxiety. There, there's a pulling or there's a self-harm of some sort, and so I just break off the spirit of, of self-harm in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name, be free of the accusation of the enemy that says you deserved it. Anxiety, go in Jesus' name. be bold and we want to continue moving in the power of the spirit we're going to sing a song and after that song we're going to come back up and we're going to introduce our prayer teams and if you're waiting for a touch from God if you're waiting for a move of God in your life if you want to be filled with the power of the spirit if you need something impossible to happen in your body mind or heart we're going to invite you forward 
We're going to pray over you. Let's continue worshiping.